be in our list somewhere. And given the website and the wonderful world of computers, we get interesting questions all the time, which Helen and Michael and some of the other people try to answer. But I had an interesting one that just came up that I thought you would enjoy. Um, and I'll read it to you. It says, hi there. Although I have no personal recollections of your charming community as I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut during the 50s, I couldn't resist sending you a note. I've been involved in genealogy for many years and was following a lead out of personal curiosity. Recently, I purchased some vintage shelf paper and it just arrived. A 59 cent price sticker from the store where it was bought was originally back in the 50s, was still on the unopened package. I was delighted. A little treasure. It was from Often Rights 5 and 10. I don't know if you people know Often Rights, okay? It used to be down the hill on, on Murray Avenue. There was one. I was delighted. Um, I tell people I'm not trying to recapture my youth, just trying to help preserve my past. I didn't stop at the spelling question in the name on Google, which kept wanting to change it. I persisted. I found an obituary for Mr. J. Harold Hell. Often Wright Jr. and read through it for clues. Sure enough, there was a mention of his family's business. He sounded like an interesting character. Again, I persisted and came to your website. Isn't it great that we had somebody that read it? <laughs> okay. Um, and I read through the memory section. We do have a memory section that people send memories that I have in there. And she couldn't help but smile reading the memory from Mike Cook of March 2005, where he bought turtles and goldfish at the Often Rights, right in Squirrel Hill. <laughs> we did the same thing, but it was in Woolworths at W.T. Grants. I know my mother would be smiling at me right now to think that I follow up on what was important to both of us when she was still with me. The great stories. It's the journey that we take in this lifetime that defines us as humans. Thanks for letting me share. And that is why we are all here, right? To share and to enjoy memories. So I thought I'd share this with you. And I don't know whether, um, yeah, this is, Mike, Mike Cook wrote an email and with his memories of walking up and living in Squirrel Hill area. And one of the things with author rights, I remember author rights. So anyway, I thought I would share that with you. Um, We are happy that Patty came back from the back of the table and came up and talked to us tonight. <laughs> right. Good evening. I'm Mike Aaron. I'm chairman of this group. Uh, we may be 11 or 12 years old, but we're not quite sure, so we're celebrating our 10th anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> and I welcome you for, for our, our 10th year. Uh, before I bring our speaker up, just a couple of things. You know we have these meetings. Uh, if, I hope everyone had a good summer and took up, we all took August off, but now we're back. We have meetings the second Tuesday of every month except August. Um, next month, the president of the Oakmont Historical Society, Gary Rogers, is going to come. And he'll talk a little about Oakmont, but he has a, written a very interesting book that goes in human interest beyond Oakmont called uh, Tales from Our Towns, Peoples, Places, and Events Forgotten by the History Books. And I've read his writing and it's very interesting and very amusing and you should enjoy that. In November, the uh, founder of Coffee Tree Roasters will come and talk to us about how that firm was founded and, and expanded. I've always tried to get some of the business people to come in to speak. Uh, most of them are reluctant. They don't think they have enough to say. They, they think that they could finish up in 15 minutes and be through, but we're continuing to work at that. I think we're going to probably have Randall's toys this year. We'll come in and talk as well. We have some of our other speakers almost ready. They'll be announced in, in the website this, this month. We may have our speakers through, through April for very long, so look at the website for that, or we'll certainly have a sheet on them next, uh, uh, you know, next month. Uh, beyond that, um, we move to our speaker tonight. Dr. Miles Richards is uh, is a first, and and this is this is praise. Dr. Richards called me, uh, saying that he had a would like very much to have a chance to speak with us. Uh, this was some months ago last year. 
Uh, this has not happened. We, we be active in the market of getting speakers, and it's always nice to have someone to call up and say they would enjoy to do that. Dr. Richards is from Pennsylvania, McKeesport, if I remember correctly, and uh, uh, had worked here for some years, including at Westinghouse, and then uh, went, but, but also studied in South Carolina at the University of South Carolina, got a history degree, and was for many years a teacher in South Carolina, kept his links in Pittsburgh, in the Pittsburgh area, and is now back here. And he, as you know, is going to talk about Walter Forward, who is tonight, who has a street named for him as well as several townships. With that further ado, please come on up, Miles, if you would. Come on up. We, uh, <laughs> trying something tonight. Uh, Miles prefer not to have to be encumbered with a microphone. So we're going to do that. But if at any point people in the back aren't hearing, all you have to do is raise your hand and you will know that you can speak up, right? Right. Okay, thank you. And if you have any questions, just interject. I, this is somewhat familiar to me because I used to teach quite a few night classes in my time at Middle East Technical College in South Carolina, although this is a different kind of group than what I normally had. I usually had students texting them while I was sitting there, and, and guys that wanted anything but to be there, and so they wanted a credit, so they would come and they thought the night school was easier than the day school. Well, they found out differently, a lot of them, so I... I did that for a good many years down there. And uh, I sort of moved away from Pennsylvania. And I'll, I, I bring greetings from the Elizabeth Township Historical Society. Now, we've been around, this will be, we've been around since November of 1976, which we found out of a, a bicentennial committee. And we have a book called Between Two Rivers. It's circulated, it's been circulating around for years. I wrote a couple of chapters of it. And how I got acquainted with Walter Forward was that I was doing a newsletter, which was in those days called Two Rivers Bullet, which was in those days typed on our kitchen, my kitchen table by myself, and then we would, somebody would polish the typing up, and then we would run it off and then send it to select people and to run our mailing list, usually members and people that, you know, had contact with us. So Walter Forward came into my what mind because my alma mater is Elizabeth Forward High School. I grew up in Elizabeth Township, and I never thought much about Elizabeth Forward. Everybody knew where Elizabeth was. That was Borough of Elizabeth, Elizabeth Township. Forward Township was that little corner tucked away. Now, how many know where Forward Township in Allegheny County is? Uh, you know? Well, it's the, the furthest county in the southwest. It's right across, if you've ever seen Rick Sabak's move, uh, film on the Three Rivers, when he's talking to whoever he's talking to in Monon City, Monongahela City, that hill across the Monongahela River is, is Lower Township. It's the furthest southwest that you can get in Allegheny County before you run into Ross Draper, down a little hamlet called Gallon. You get, get, and you're in Westmoreland and Ross Street. And it's across from Washington uh, County, and also it's away from uh, just a little bit below, I guess, the Monongahela River or above uh, Elizabeth, the borough of Elizabeth. It's a rural area, very different from Elizabeth Township, which has grown up. But I never thought there was any connection between that and Forward Township here. And I was surprised to find out it was indeed named for the same man, Walter Forward. So I began to get curious about exactly who Walter Forward was. And so I wrote a newsletter story essay once long ago. I didn't even sign my name to it. In those days, I didn't until somebody from Johnson to Point said, what, asked about the unknown writer of that. <laughs> So nowadays, of course, I, I do it all the time. You know, I, put my, I don't write anything that I don't put 
able to name one. And, and uh, that I learned in the academy to do that. So ever, ever since then, so Walter Ford was this essay that I did years and years ago, probably 1980, 81. So I've never really forgotten them, and then I kept, but it's interesting that the only time I've actually seen samples of his handwriting are in South Carolina. The papers of John C. Calhoun, oh, which was edited at the University of South Carolina, and the editor, Clyde Wilson, was a guy I knew. In fact, he was my professor on and off. And Clyde once said to me, you want to see a sample of Walter Ford's handwriting? Here it is. So he, he pulled it out. And it's part of the Calhoun papers, which are a multi-volume set that are in many libraries. That was done down in South Carolina, in, in the University of South Carolina, in the history department. So that's the only time I've ever seen Walter Ford's signature and his handwriting. And that would be in South Carolina. So it's a small world. You never quite get away from your past. Now, Walter Ford, before I go into, you know, the different places named for him and how he got Ford Township named for him, how he got it up at Butler, I have no idea. I have a good, I know why he was named here. His home was right up at the corner of Forbes and Shady, or uh, Forward and Shady. I guess where Taylor Alderdice is now is probably where his home was. So that's how that came about. But uh, let me go on with Ford himself. And I'll explain also late in the end of the talk about how Ford Township got named for him in 1869, long after his death. Now, Walter Forward, from what I can tell, was born on January 24, 1786, in a little town of East Granby, Connecticut, which is, I'm told, not too far out of Hartford. And he grew up there until he was 14 when his family moved out over New York. This was pre uh, Erie Canal, but it was one of the migration routes out of New England. A lot of New England Yankees went out through western New York and then went into the Western Reserve, which is north east of High, where Cleveland area, Oberlin, all that was the Western Reserve. That's why Western Reserve University is named. Now, many of you have probably been in the town he lived in for a while in his boyhood, Aurora, Ohio. Any, anybody know why that rings a bell? Yes. SeaWorld. If you wanted to go up and see Shamu the killer whale, you would have gone up to, up, up to Aurora, Ohio. Now in those days, it's not too far, by the way, from Oberlin. So that's, if you've ever been to Oberlin, you weren't far from where he grew up. Now, after they moved out there when he was in about 14, he worked for a while on the family farm. That's what he had done in Connecticut. But he was not one to be a farm hand, farm boy, and he wasn't interested in the life of a, being a farmer. So his is sort of an Horatio Alger story before there was ever Horatio Alger. He decided for some reason that he wanted to be a, lo a lawyer. Now he did teach school in a grammar school up around there for a couple terms, but then he decided that was it. April of 1803 he decided to head for Pittsburgh, which was the nearest large city. And so basically, according to the tradition, he walked. Now I think there's a little bit of exaggeration in the tale. I'm sure that he probably had other ways of transportation here and there, but he basically worked his way from Aurora, Ohio to Pittsburgh. And <coughs> apparently went looking for a prominent lawyer named Henry Baldwin whose office was down right downtown. And he was, so he was down on Market Street where he encountered people that knew Baldwin, and so he was pointed out to Baldwin's office. And somehow, given the earnestness of him, apparently Baldwin decided that he would be able to be a legal apprentice and read law in his office. That's the way he pretty much did it back in those days. He read law in an established attorney's law library 
Paul will suppose have had one of the best in Western Pennsylvania, and that's how Walter Forward became a lawyer. Now he also, to earn his keep, besides what he got doing legal errands for Baldwin, he became the editor of a newspaper, which was the second, supposedly the second newspaper west of the Alleghenies. I guess the old, whatever the sun, tell you know, the, what, what's the name of the newspaper down here, the morning paper here? Name slips me. Post <laughs> Gazette. Well, I think the Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh Gazette was the first one. Now, the uh, paper that he edited was called The Tree of Liberty, which was basically a Jeffersonian Republican newspaper. But it was in opposition to another paper. There were two factions of Jeffersonian Republicans out here. When I will say Republican, I'm talking about not the Republican Party we know, but, or think we know, but the Republican Party, the Jeffersonian Party called itself Democratic Republicans, and people <coughs> referred to them as Republicans. And I, it, it, to me it's kind of cumbersome to say Jeffersonian Republicans, I'll just say the Republican. But these were two papers, there were, the other paper was called the Commonwealth, and they, they represented factions out here. Now since the time of the Whiskey Rebellion, there hadn't really been a Federalist Party. That was the party of George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, etc., etc., etc. And the tree of, this Tree of Liberty was edited by Walter Ford. Although everybody knew that the two guys that really owned the paper and called the shots were Henry Baldwin and one Tarleton Bates. Hmm. Of Virginia, Bates Street. Bates Street, and he was a Virginian, and he was also he had come up to Fort Fayette as a soldier, and then he had stayed on and was on his way to apparently a very good career. Now I'm sure the few Federalists that were around must have really loved it, watching these two papers wham at each other. It was particularly over it, it dated back to when Thomas Mifflin had run for governor. And then a guy named McCain had run for governor. And they had, they had, they had factionalized into these two different warring factions. And they, they let it, you know, they went at each other hammer and tongs. In fact, they eventually got to the point in late, late December 1805, Bates wrote a scathing article about a guy named Pentland, Ephraim Pentland, who was involved with the other paper. And the two of them got into an argument on the street and then basically agreed to fight a duel, which was outlawed. Well, Pentland basically solved the, 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 his problem with Bates, but then his second got in it with him, a guy named Stuart. And so the Stuart Bates duel would be fought at Three Mile Creek, which is right down on the Monongahela, right where Jones and Lachlan used to run, the old Jones and Lachlan plan. That's where the last fatal duel occurred. So in a way, on January 8, 1806, that was the, the last duel of Pennsylvania, and Ford is kind of a tangential figure to it. Now the four guys that went down were Bates and Stewart, but then Interestingly, Stuart's second was William Wilkins, a rising <laughs> attorney who would basically parallel Forward's career for much of their next four decades. And uh, the night before Bates went to, the, to have his quote-unquote interview, as they used to call duels, he wrote out his will and he wrote it and dictated it to, to Walter Forward who was by this point almost ready to be an attorney, ready to join the Pennsylvania Bar. So Ford was not down on the actual dual ground. Now from what I can tell, the duel was not in any way, nobody made any effort to try to solve the thing or amicably settle. They went down and meant business. Nobody exchanged a word, no greetings, no small talk. They went right at it. 
missed on their first volleys. They reloaded and shot the second time, and this time Bates got it. And he would die. He would be the last person in Pennsylvania to die from a duel in a duel, which had become very, very bad in many places. Now, of course, where I was down south for years, they dueled all the way to the 1860s and 70s. So that was the code of honor. Now, Bates, by the way, his two brothers would later become prominent Republicans. And Edward Bates would be Abraham Lincoln's uh, attorney general in the Civil War. They would go off to Missouri and make a great career. Bates would have been a they say a great figure in Keystone State history if he hadn't decided to play, do the code of honor. Now his Virginia relatives understood exactly what happened, you know, and didn't. They were sad he died, but they were glad he, he held his honor. Now just for the record, what happened, Stuart took off for Baltimore and wound up in Philadelphia. He was the winner. Wilkins went off to Kentucky for a year, sort of to get out of way. But Pentland, who was the original protagonist, he would go over to Allegheny City and would become a city father over there and an official and would be mayor of the Foster family. And Stephen Foster would, uh, his, the first female muse to Stephen Foster would be, a, would be Susan Pentland, who lived on the commons next to the Fosters. And Stephen Foster's first song, Open Thy Lattice Love, Listen to Me, was dedicated to Susan Pentland, who being a good singer, apparently sang a lot of Foster's, uh, gave first, would be the first one to sing one of Foster's two tunes. So things kind of go in weird circles in, in this. Now as far as Forward, well, Forward went on within months of the, um, Duel, he would be admitted to the bar, so he nothing happened to him. He married an, a, a Henrietta Barclay of Greensburg, so I guess he had some business interests out in later on out in Westmoreland County. He had a brother, Chauncey, that showed up in Pittsburgh later and went off to Somerset and became a fairly distinguished figure out in the bar in Somerset. Is Chauncey forward? And, but Walter Ford would, would make his career in Pittsburgh. He settled down on Penn Avenue, and, and, or at Penn and Sixth is where he would live much of his first years as an attorney. And he would enjoy over the years a very extensive legal practice, and I am told it's on several occasions he was a litigator in front of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court as well as the Federal Supreme Court. And then as now, not any lawyer can go in and be a litigator in, to be a member of the Supreme Court bar. You have to be pretty good. And like Baldwin before him, and by the way, Baldwin was down there at the duel too. Baldwin would later be 17 years from 1830 to 1847 when he on the United States Supreme Court. I'll make a remark about how there's a dearth of biographies about a lot of these figures that I've seen, unless there's some that have been written in the years I've been gone. Now, just about every Tom, Dick, and Harry in South Carolina in that era has got a biography of him, <laughs> but, but not a peer. Now, Forward's legal practice, he was supposed to be one of the best courtroom orders of them all, and given the crowd that he was with. That must have been a, quite an accomplishment. I gather his most famous courtroom early appearance was representing one John Tiernan in 1818, who was an Irish itinerant laborer charged with murder. He was working on the Greensburg Pike, which is basically Penn Avenue. And it, of course, intersects into the old Forbes Trail, Forbes Road, and goes all the way to Greensburg. But Patrick Campbell, the road contractor, and his tiered in had a, had a wage fight. So what happened was the Irish migrant had also been complaining about working conditions and seemed to be 
before such figures were around, seems to have been something of a union organizer. He was trying to kind of get the workers together to, you know, collectively demand, you know, working conditions and wages. Well, anyway, he got in a big fight and with Campbell and stalked off, but that same night, December 7th, 1817, Campbell was found in a storage shed down near Turtle Creek with a bullet through his heart. And Tiernan was later supposedly spotted riding on Campbell's horse heading for McKeesport. They eventually bagged him down in a farmhouse in Mifflin Township, which would be West Mifflin, Duquesne, etc., all the way to Mifflin Township ran all the way almost to where Clarendon is today in the old Allegheny County maps. If you look at Mifflin Township, it was a big, big place. And in a farmhouse down there, there is where Tiernan was grabbed. He was taken in and was tried, and there was a great deal of feeling against Tiernan because this was still a hierarchical society we lived in. And striking out against your betters, and to get you know a worker striking against his boss, his employer, was considered very bad form and not accepted. So there was a lot of bad feeling against this guy, against Tiernan, and his stand against his against his boss was considered a dangerous defiance to establish order. So. Forward decided to defend Tiernan against the warnings of many of his associates. Now, there were a couple of others in the defense team, so this is not exactly him going up, you know, lonely figure against the mob. But William Wilkins, who had been on the other side of the dual dispute, was on the prosecution side and was one of the prosecutors. So this would be another time that these two would kind of cross swords, so to speak. Anyway, what happened was Tiernan was, despite a spirited courtroom defense by Forward, Tiernan was found guilty of uh, murder, and on March 18, 1818, he was hanged on Boyd's Hill, which was right above where that's up on the bluff where Duquesne is, and that's where they used to hang him, and you would see them hanging from the gallows for a little while, just as a reminder to others, not to on that path. So whether or not this got him in any long-standing trouble, I doubt it, because within a couple of years, Ford was, along with many others, you know, getting involved deeply in politics. Uh, being an active Jeffersonian at this point was pretty easy because the Federalist Party had pretty much disintegrated after the War of 1812. They had descended against the War of 1812, and when the war town came out looking like something of a victory. And by the way, we're in the bicentennial of that war. Uh, so anyway, when that ended, the Federalist Party, the last time they mounted a national campaign was 1816. And so in this so-called era of good feeling, we were basically in a one-party state <coughs> in this country. We had the Jeffersonian Republicans. Uh, they started referring to themselves as the National Republicans. And during the years of James Monroe, there was literally, it was factions within the Democratic, or what would be Democratic Party or Republican Party, rather than, you know, Federalists versus Democrat. There were a few people around still calling themselves Federalists, like William Wilkins briefly did. But that was, became pretty much a no-no. Now, what happens, Forward wins in the 14th District, succeeds one Andrew Stewart, and he basically had been preceded into the, or no, he didn't precede Stewart, it was Baldwin. Henry Baldwin had held the seat, then he went up to a judgeship, so the seat opened and Forward moved right in, and he would represent three, three sessions in Congress in the 1820s. Pittsburgh area, the 14th, and then later they gerrymandered around to the 16th. And so he was right there on the spot in Washington. He would, everybody was a national republic, was a, was a Jeffersonian 
national Republican. But then in the year 1824, Matt Monroe, the last vestige of the Civil of the Revolutionary War, he's the last president that had anything to do with the Revolutionary War. He's leaving office, and it's a battle royal for succession. If you had gone into the Monroe cabinet, you would have seen four members of the cabinet all going for the, wanting the, to be the successor. You had John Quincy Adams, Secretary of State, representing basically New England. You had a Secretary of Treasury, William C. Crawford, basically he was a Virginian but had located to Georgia. And he was basically representing the Virginia dynasty as they called Jefferson Monroe, Madison and Monroe were called the Virginia dynasty. And it was sort of, he was viewed as sort of a continuation of that succession. There was also a William Wirt, Attorney General, who also had that ambitions. And the Secretary of War, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, he was still trying to be a nationalist, but he was <coughs> recognized as being representing the South. And then sort of the wild card in it, if there's a fifth one, Henry Clay, Speaker of the House. Gavin Harry of the West, Speaker of the House, uh, Senator, Congressman from Kentucky for many years. Henry Clay would be, at, from 1824 to 1848, he would be available every time. I mean, he's got to be the perennial office candidate for president of them all. I mean, he never gets the prize. Close, but no cigar. 1824, he came in through his support and went, but when they counted up all the votes, there was another wild card that had gotten in the count, Andrew Jackson. Now, I'm not going to get into Andy Jackson's career. You can read about him, but he had, ever since the War of 1812 and the Battle of New Orleans, he had been the, the guy, supposedly, he was the candidate representing the West, much to Henry Clay's dismay. Clay had styled himself the man of the West from Kentucky. But down below in Tennessee, there's Jackson. And Andrew Jackson got a, quite a, a groundswell for him. And the Jacksonians were a real melange of different groups. I won't even begin. I taught this stuff and everything, so bear with me if I seem to relapse into this. But uh, he was a, Jackson basically almost ran the table. But he didn't get enough votes in the Electoral College. He got two or three short. So what happens when you don't have a majority in the Electoral House, in the, in the, in the Electoral College? Where does the, where does the election go to? To the House of Representatives. Where every state has one vote, it doesn't matter what the individual congressman, it's not done by plurality, but if the majority of the congressmen from a particular state vote for a particular candidate, that state would then have to cast that vote for. Now, Forward supported John Quincy Adams. Well, the most, Pennsylvania, most of the Pennsylvania delegation supported Jackson. Jack, Pennsylvania would be a Jacksonian state for a couple decades, largely Jacksonian in sympathy. And anyway, what happened was Henry Clay was fourth in the race, so he was more or less eliminated, plus the other candidate who had gotten a pretty good percentage of the vote, Crawford, he had been struck down with a stroke, but he still kept his name in the, in the, in the pot, in, in, in the running. But Clay had a choice between Adams and Jackson. And as far as Jackson, he was concerned, that was a no-brainer. Jackson and Clay loathed each other. In fact, Andy Jackson once was asked on his deathbed if he had two regrets. He said, yeah, there were two. One, I didn't shoot Henry Clay. And the other one was that I didn't hang John C. Calhoun. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of Jackson the man. Well, anyway, from all available evidence, it's Clay and Adams who agreed on most issues of policy, not that they had ever particularly liked each other. 
John Quincy Adams was not a lovable figure. I mean, he was an Adams. So anyway, to make a long story short, they had a meeting and apparently cut a deal that when Adams got Clay's votes and support, and, and when if Clay helped put him over the top and get the majority of the states to vote for him, he would appoint him Secretary of State, which in those days was seen as something of a stepping stone, not the vice presidency. Calhoun, by the way, had ensconced himself into the vice presidential race. He had tested the waters and had decided he'd wait till things went on. Well, what happens after 1824, the corrupt bargain, as the Jacksonians would yell. And Andy Jackson basically resigns from the Senate, where he's been sitting for Tennessee, and starts a four-year election. And if you think Barack Obama got obstructed by the Republicans, you didn't see anything compared to what the Jacksonian followers did to the Clay, to the, to the Adams Clay administration. And they had no mercy on them and their supporters. Now, Forward seems to have wound, wound up in the, in the Clay, Adams Clay camp. And so in 1826, he swept out of office. The Jacksonians are already at it. And in 1828, of course, Andy Jackson, Andrew Jackson and his quote-unquote Jackson Democrats. And that's really where the term Democrat. If you want to know who started the term Democrat, it was Martin Van Buren, Jackson's lieutenant, a New York man, and, and really the two founders of the Democratic National Party, as we know it, are Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren. Those were the two that did it. And the, the Jackson Democrats, led by James Buchanan, Andrew Dallas, and others, Henry Baldwin, Ward was on their hit list and they got him. Now he would eventually, after his days in office, he would, for supporting Clay and Adams, he would be pretty much drummed out of the Democrat, Democratic Party. Now, for a while, the uh, Jackson people, they referred to themselves as Democrats. The opposition, for the first few years, called themselves National Republicans. And that's what Walter Ford was. And Ford he did have his pleasant period in his time, even though it must not have been pleasant to be getting abuse here heaped on him all the time by the opposition. He was part of the crew that came and welcomed Marquise de Lafayette to Pittsburgh in 1825, when Lafayette did that big circuit. You name it, Lafayette was there. And he, there's a town that he didn't seem to hit before that trip. He was on the lam, by the way, from being mixed up in a cootie tall in France. So he had had a long-standing invitation to come over, and he took it finally because it got, he was trying to, to he, he didn't particularly like the king of France and wanted to replace him with another one. And it didn't work out, so Lafayette figured it was convenient to be gone for a while, so he was gone until the, the, the heat wore down. Now, between 1828 and 1837, after he was out of office, he went back, forward goes back to his uh, law practice, gets active in Pittsburgh civic affairs, there's a whole generation of lawyers to the state bar that worked under Ford and sponsored him into the bar. His law library was supposed to have been very good. He formed the Pittsburgh Law Library Association. I think some of the uh, vestiges of that are in the law library down in, you know, down in the Allegheny County Law Library. He also was involved in founding Pitt, he invested in land, he was a land speculator, and I suspect that's how he got associated up in Butler with Forward Township, because I think he owned land up that way. Baldwin, for that matter, did too. He was up in Meadville much of his time, much of the time, and before he went to the court. So anyway, he was on boards of directors. In 1837, he was at the Pennsylvania Constitutional Convention, where they were trying to, which basically gave the governor four years rather than two years and, re and 
serving more than one term, and there was a lot, a lot of our constitution today, the state constitution, is, is although it's been revised, I guess since then, a lot of it is based still in the 1837 convention. And he was a pretty outspoken Whig. 1839, December of 1839, he was down in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where they held the first really political convention outside of a couple of Democrats through. They didn't wait till the year of the nomination. They, they, they did it in a church in Harrisburg. I think it was the first Presbyterian Church of Harrisburg. And there they nominated Henry Clay, they thought. That's what Ford went out to do. But since Clay had too many enemies, it was thought to be electoral poison in some parts of the country. The opposition to Jackson, which were starting to call themselves the Whigs, they had beginning, they had really started to call themselves Whigs in 1832, 1833. King Andrew, in, if you know anything about English history, the two parties in England were the Tories and the Whigs, and the Whigs were the party usually were, were against the monarchy and monarchical power. And that's sort of what the image was for why they called their party the Whig Party. King Andrew was seen as a tyrant. I mean, a lot of the stuff that you have thrown at uh, Barack Obama, they were throwing it at, 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 at uh, Jackson. I'm going to hurry on, though. Uh, I'm not going to get into that story anymore. But, but the Whig Party would hang around until the late 1850s. Would be, they would basically disintegrate over the slave controversy. But the second party system, as we call it, were the Whigs and the Democrats. And the original reason for the two parties was Andrew Jackson, who probably was the most formidable American president between Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln. Although I would also commend to you James K. Polk, who was a one-termer, but if you ever want to read about a successful president who did everything he was promised and did it in one term, which was one of his promises, it would be Polk. But I, he's not central to the story, so I won't get into Polk. But anyway, he basically, Clay went down a Harrison man, to be a, was a Clay man, but when William Henry Harrison got the nod instead, and he was mostly famous for the Battle of Tippecanoe fought back in 1811, which was basically fought out near Purdue University and was basically a draw, but the way the propaganda told it, it was a great victory. So that was where Tippecanoe and Tyler too came in. Tyler was thrown in as sort of a balance. Tyler was a Whig in name only. He was anti-Jackson because of the nullification crisis of 1832, but in most respects he was a states' right Southern Democrat, and a Whig only because of the, the nullification crisis back about the tariff of 1828. I've got steeped in that in South Carolina, <laughs> so I want, and I choose not to talk about it, but that was why Tyler had been in the Whig party. He was among a group of Calhoun followers, more or less, that went over into the Whig party. And so that was where that came from. Now, I have a little bit of a direct link to Tyler. I actually know John Tyler's grandson. Uh -huh. His name is Lion G. Tyler, for many years professor at the Citadel. And he was the youngest son of the youngest son. Tyler had two sets of families. And the youngest child by Julia Gardner, Tyler, was Lion G. Tyler Sr., who was for many years on the faculty of William and Mary. And his son, William Lion G. Tyler Jr., was for many years on the faculty of the Citadel. And I ran into him at, the, at many Southern Historical Association conferences, a couple Citadel conferences on the South. So I got to meet Tyler, and he looks like his grandfather. <laughs> and when I asked him, is that his great-grandson? When somebody said, no, it's his grandson. What? Uh. And they're actually, he's got siblings. There's another sibling that actually lives in Sherwood Forest, the Tyler family home. So they're, they're, I have 
connections. I've, and I, we used to joke when, when Lion Tyler and John T. and Clyde Wilson would meet, and they would talk about Tyler and Calhoun. That would have been almost like Turk talking in first person. That's the way we used to joke about it. Because one knew everything there was about Tyler, and the other one knew everything there was to know about Calhoun. So anyway, Tippecanoe and Tyler 2-1, uh, that campaign was, of course, the Log House campaign, and the, you know, common folk, and Jackson had started that template of being, you know, from, from the common man. But Tyler was a Virginia gentleman by birth. His father had signed the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Harrison. And so he was far from the typical, but he had made most of his career in Indiana. Now, unfortunately for everybody that were Whigs, Tyler Harrison would not last too long. Now for his ardent work for uh, the ticket, Ford was put on as Comptroller General of the United States under Harrison. Now Harrison lasted all of one month. He apparently went on a raw cold day on his inauguration March 5th. He spoke for an hour and a half, which I better start. <laughs> he got sick. He, he went to the inaugural ball, danced far into the night, and then spent the rest of his time in his month in office basically trying to fill, figure out federal patronage positions and fending off Henry Clay, who thought he was going to be something of the prime minister of the, of the Harris administration. Well, Harrison dies one month into his presidency, and then voila, John Tyler, who was down in Virginia at, at Sherwood Forest, his Tidewater Plantation, gets the word that Harrison is dead, and you're now president. Now, Tyler is a fascinating character in many ways. His presidency is like none other. He was the first president to come in by death of his predecessor. The old joke about a vice president only having two duties to uh, preside over the Senate and then read the papers in the morning to see if he has to go to a funeral. And, uh, <laughs> that's basically what happens to Tyler. But the question was, was this guy really president in, in reality, since he was not elected? And he was called his accidency by some of his, <laughs> his by, by some of his critics, and he was, you know, there was thing. Was he just an acting president, or did he have full presidential powers? Well, he insisted he had full presidential powers. Unfortunately for him, even though he didn't like him, John Quincy Adams pretty much settled the question when he said, "My father, when he was to be vice president under Washington." One of the questions he asked before he answered the question is, if anything happens to Washington, will I be president as, as fully as my as George Washington had been? And basically the answer had been from none other than James Madison, yes. So that settled that question. Now, unfortunately, Tyler was literally, he's got the most unique presidency because not only was he the first one to come in by way of a death, he was also a man with literally without a party. He was president by veto because Henry Clay had a very ambitious program that he wanted to get legislated, which was called his American system. And one of the things was to recreate, recharter a third national bank. There had been two national banks before that had come and gone. That had been the big, the one of the big, the second, the chartering of the sec, rechartering of the second national bank had one had been had been one of the big battles of the Jacksonian years in the 1830s, and the whole issue of the, of the currency and and of, of banking. There, people like Tyler basically believed in a divorce between government and banking. So, what happens is there are two different times Congress tries, which has a Whig majority, tries to enact a, a second national bank, recharter a third national bank. Tyler vetoes both times. 
clay almost has a hissy about it. And basically, the, the clay crowd writes Tyler out of the uh, out of the out of the party and become his bitter enemies. He kind of furthered them later. They, they also wanted to pass what they called internal improvements, in other words, infrastructure. And so there were several big internal improvement bills that got vetoed by Tyler, who was a state's writer. He didn't believe the federal government had had power. It was not enumerated. So he, he vetoed it. And even though he didn't have a party, he had a, you know, he managed to pull it off. Now, to make a long story short, uh, after that first veto of the, of the National Bank at Clay's instruction, all the Clay people, except for Daniel Webster, who was Secretary of State, get out of the cabinet. They resign in mass in protest at Clay's urging. Webster stayed in because he was negotiating an, an intricate treaty with the British Foreign Minister, Secretary. And they were the what and to settle many of the outstanding issues like the Great Lakes, the militarization, and the Canadian US border, which had been roiling since the time of the revolution. So Webster stated, and I think that is one of the reasons why Forward decides to you know accept the invitation of Tyler to become the new Secretary of Treasury. He succeeds a guy named Ewing, Tom Ewing of Ohio, who was a clay acolyte. So for two years, Walter Ford is Secretary of Treasury in his party, in this administration, which really has no party except what they call the Corporal Guard. A few guys here and there that were, were Tyler men in the Congress. The Democrats don't want Tyler. They regard him as a renegade and the, certainly the clay Whigs don't want any part of him. And he's a lame duck if ever there was one. But here, and Forward basically does a pretty good job. Now one thing he tried to do, there was no central institution of finance. After that second national bank went down the tubes, there was nothing. So and there had been a variety of state banks all the federal money had been dispersed to these state banks, or pet banks, as Jackson's enemies called them. There was the Panic of 1837, which had been partially caused by this. There were a lot of other issues, but in the 1830s, in the, much of the 40s, the United States was in depression. Every 20 so years or so, you'd have a big financial meltdown. I mean, that was sort of just part of the economy. You had no real currency of note except gold, gold coin. There was a dispute whether you had paper money or hard coin, hard and soft money. That issue would roil through the 19th century all the way into the 20th. Now, Harris forward realizes you've got to have something. And he knows Tyler will have nothing to do with anything resembling a national bank. And he knows that the clay Whigs and their allies don't want anything other than a national bank. So he tries to sp split the difference. He basically says you have to have a comprehensive reform of the national monetary system or else, you know, we'll be forever in bad trouble. So he, he suggests the creation of what's called the Federal Board, the Board of Exchequer. Now this entity was headed by a governing board which would consist of the Secretary of Treasury, the U.S. Treasurer and three independent commissioners. They would have subsidiary branches in every state, and these branches would help handle all public monies and legal bills of exchange, and would even issue paper money, paper notes, which would be recognized as currency. And what does this sort of sound like? Federal Reserve. Yeah. And they would also have deposits of either gold or silver in certificate up to $15 million in value. So in many ways, he's anticipating the Federal Reserve. But the thing never has a chance because the two 
major parties want nothing of it, neither does President Tyler. So the thing gets buried in the Congressional Committee system. With Henry Clay, it's National Bank or nothing, and with Tyler, John C. Calhoun, and everybody else, it's divorce of banking and, and government. So he's kind of between a rock and a hard place. Now another thing that happens to, to forward is that he does not get along too well with Tyler after he becomes aware that Tyler is hell-bent for annexing Texas and as a slave state. And it's pretty well known that the Jackson Democrats, Jackson, James K. Polk and company are, you know, in that, in that mindset too. So basically, several months before all this hits the fan, Forward resigns and it's rapidly accepted. <laughs> Another thing he didn't like was he could see that John C. Calhoun was about to come into the into the administration as Secretary of State. And what Calhoun was bound and determined to do was get Texas in as a slave state and therefore add another slave vote and more representatives in the two House of Commons. See, the two, the, this, this Southern Demo Southerners knew, the slave people knew that they were losing the, the battle. And whether you like to admit it or not, for the first bit of our history, really up to the Civil War, the national government had been a, had been a slave Southern government. Most of the presidents had been Southerners. The Senate, as long as you could get a free and slave state balance in, if you admitted a free state, you admit a slave state, that was another thing. As long as you kept it out of the territories, they had that 1820 compromise of 3630, you know, line, everything below that slave, everything above that uh, free. And, you know, also, they, but they knew that if more slave states did not come into the Union quickly, and more and more free states came in, they knew that they were going to lose the numbers game. And in 1860, when Abraham Lincoln gets elected president, for the first time they have an anti-slavery guy in, and that's why South Carolina, among others, decided it was time to get out. They had lost control of the national government, and they knew it. And they knew that Lincoln would also be able to start appointing justices that probably wouldn't be Southerners and be pro-slavery people. That was, that's one of the ticking time bombs going off. And the Mexican War, which was a result of the annexation of Texas, was, to, was started that chain of events from 1846, 47, 48, all the way to 1860, 61. I mean, you're going to go through that whole, whole, whole chain. Now, Forward, I don't know what his view on slavery was. I suspect he was probably like a lot of them. He didn't want it to, to go into the territories, but they didn't want to abolish it where it existed. And probably if he would have been asked, he would have been an emancipationist rather than a, I don't have any proof on this, rather than an abolitionist. Emancipationists were for compensating the masters for their slave losses. They also were calling for gradual elimination of it by stages. And they also wanted to, if possible, get as many of them back to Africa as they could. That's why there was an American Colonization Society. Henry Clay was very much in this camp, and I think this is where Forward was in. Yeah. Now, Forward would basically sit out the next four years. He opposed the Mexican War, probably, because most, just about every Whig did in the North. But he did, when Zachary Taylor got elected president in 1848, after four years of very partisan Democrat rule by Polk, when Zachary Taylor comes in for services done, he is appointed the U.S. minister to, to Denmark. See, we didn't have ambassadors in those days because that was considered an ambassador of a monarch. So until really the 20th century, U.S. diplomats abroad in our embassies were U.S. ministers rather than ambassadors. The only exception would be around 1900, the uh, Court of St. James 
and then later France would be the first full-fledged U.S. ambassadors. Before that, everybody was the U.S. minister. So for two years, he was in Denmark and he helped uh, negotiate a commercial treaty between U.S. and Denmark. So he, he was helpful. And, but in 1850, he discovers that he's been elected chief judge of Allegheny County District Court in Pittsburgh. He succeeds one Judge Hopewell Hepburn, and he is happily presiding for two years over this, and one day while presiding over a murder trial, he suddenly gets stricken, goes into his chambers, and apparently on November 24th, 1852, dies of a heart attack. And that's the end of him. He's, his, he's buried in Allegheny Cemetery. And uh, I've never seen his grave. I've talked a couple times about going down there, but I did. So that's basically Walter Forward. Are there Forwards around the place? Yeah, there's a, he had a son, Walter Forward, too, Walter S. Forward. What he did, I don't know. There was this Chauncey Forward out in Somerset, which was a brother. And his home, he lived on at 6th and Penn, and then in later years, he, I think he had, this was a cottage he had up there first, and then he built his big home up there. And according to tradition, he would walk in to work from up there down to the, the, the courthouse downtown. So he came up here when this was still a pretty rural, out-of-the-way spot. So that's Walter Ford. Now, how he got Ford Township named after him, that's going to be the question. Okay, that will be your first question. <laughs> I was going to say, oh, when did Forward Avenue become Forward? <laughs> I guess as they started to build up in the late 19th, middle to the late 19th century, that would be something for somebody in the Squirrel Hill Historical Society to find out. <laughs> when they started the development plans up here, now the millionaires, he, were, he originally was down sort of on Lawyer's Road, down on 6th and Penn was where a lot of the big... And I think what he was probably doing was, was uh, emulating his friend and sometimes enemy, William Wilkins. Wilkins, by the way, had come into the Tyler Cabinet too as Secretary of War. And these two individuals are very parallel. And Wil when Wilkins build, builds his big home, then I think he... I think he was a, you know, a wannabe. Now, how Forward Township got named for him? When they created uh, Elizabeth, when they created Allegheny County in 1788, everything between the Yawkegany and Monongahela River was Elizabeth Township, named for Elizabeth McKay Baird, the wife of the founders of Elizabeth Stephen Baird. And that stayed happily until 1869. And then, in 1869, they split it up into three different entities. Now, the Elizabeth Township of today retained the old name of Elizabeth Township. That was one of them. Another part of it was called uh, Lincoln Township, now known as Lincoln Borough. There's also a little, there's a town of Portview and Liberty Borough, which were part of Lincoln, the old Lincoln Township. And then the third part, the most distant part of the township in Allegheny County, was named for Forward. And that's how he got the name. There was some people, because a lot of the early people that resided in Forward Township were from New Jersey, there was a suggestion to call it Jersey Township, but that apparently didn't go over. And according to what Mr. Netchai said, the judge who made the decision on it, although I was told it was it's the Pennsylvania General Assembly that did it. He had been a, one of Forward's apprentices, so he liked them, and so he named them, so that's where the name Forward Township came from. I've never found any evidence that Forward owned any connect, had any local connection out there to that township. Now, James G. Blaine did, longtime man from Maine, but he was also from West Brownsville, Pennsylvania and had a lot of interest in the Mon Valley, including a big chunk of coal land. 
Lane Hill. Lane Hill. That's that's the township. And he also owned Plain Coal Company, which became the exclusive supplier of coal to Henry Clay Frick's Clare Works, or his Coke Works. So to make a long story short, the only other thing that I can find of honoring 40s, apparently got a U.S. Coast Guard cutter named after him. How that happened, God knows. <laughs> and Forward Township up in Butler, your guess is as good as mine on that one. Now, interestingly, Ford Township just got mentioned the other day in the paper. The chief of police out there was one of the 26 arrested in the, in the numbers. And <laughs> I knew about eight of them. <laughs> That's amazing. Out there, we do, out there, you know, video poker numbers and stuff are just sort of part of the fabric of daily life. <laughs> and, and, you know, so we, we, you know, it, it's been common knowledge who's doing what and where. So anyway, that's this guy's chief of police. And now he's on the dock. Which one? The one out in Elizabeth Town, the one out in Allegheny. So that's the story of Walter Forward. I've also learned what to cut. Yeah. Harrison died in office. He was like in 1840, is that correct? Yep. So it seemed like in 20 years, the president died in office after that year. That's, yeah, that's after good. 1960. Yeah. They had been lucky up to 1840. There had been no president. That was one of the unmentioned things about what are you going to do if the president dies in office? Is the vice president going to be the vice president? Because really, they didn't give much thought to what a vice president did. As Tom Marshall said, it was Woodrow Wilson's vice president. He said that he's the one who made the famous comment if you presided over the Senate and got up and read the papers and said, see if you want to, to be funeral. The other pre vice presidential joke I heard was two sons, a woman had two sons, both got lost. One got lost at sea, the other became vice president. Yeah, that was after 1960. Yeah. yeah. We actually had there were actually stretches where we didn't have vice presidents. They died. Neglect. Any other The uh, the certificates for participation in the history course for two credits will be at the rear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we got more than I expected tonight. The, uh, remember, we'll see you next month from the Dope Hall.